um, uh, thank you for joining me in this uh, in this run up to the festive season. As you can see, I'm in my uh, my festive Santa's grotto here um, that's because I'm not able to record in the studio today. So I've had to very quickly throw up a, a festive backdrop. Um, but uh, I, I hope I will play the role of, of Santa effectively today because we've got a bit of a, a treat for you um, on the other end of uh, the line uh, many, many miles from, from where I am is uh, Christian Varga. Um, he's uh, somebody who I hope will be familiar to uh, a lot of you for his, um, his illustrations. Um, so hi Christian, thank you for, for joining me. Uh, whereabouts thank are you. you currently? I am in uh, Lower Bavaria in a small town called Lansu. Ah, lovely. In, yeah, you're not wearing your your stereotypical lederhosen for our for our chat today. Well, no, nah, I'm not really. I don't really have the legs for lederhosen. You see, because like, I don't I think anyone lederhosen. has the legs for lederhosen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, there's a few blokes around here that oh, yeah. man, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> the more into the countryside you go, you see, the more right. often you find them. Fair enough. So stay, mm -hmm. stay clear of Bavarian countryside would be your your advice. Well, uh, yeah, <laughs> I used to live in the country until not long ago. It's sort of, it's, yeah, it's its own thing. Let's put it that way. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Let, let's leave yeah. that one there. <laughs> so Christian, as you'll know, the the sort of subject title for this little series of interviews um, is a beverage and a baked good. So I, I have got with me, because it's nearly Christmas, I've got ginger wine um, to uh, oil the, the wheels of conversation. Um, and in honour of, um, of our German guest, I have, of course, got some Stollen on hand. Yeah, yes. For consumption very, later very on. Very okay. If I, I'm, it's impossible to eat neatly, so I probably won't do it on the screen. I might hover off if we do some screen share. Yeah, okay, fair enough. So, yes, what, um, what do you have for us? Your recommendations? Okay, I'm actually still waiting on my drink at present, but it shouldn't be much longer. But it's going to be mild. Okay. Wine. And uh, oh, this is wine, right? So, glow mm -hmm. wine, if you will. Yeah. And oh, wow. uh, homemade as well. And uh, for my baked. The wine food, or I just the mold bit? Just the mold bit. Is it, is yeah. it, is it we didn't make the, the wine ourselves. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's right. And uh, oh, there it is. Wonderful. Thanks. So ah. this is my drink here. You can't actually you can see a little bit. <laughs> it's red. Cheers. Yeah. Cheers. Excellent stuff. Right. And for my baked goods. What's the shirt for today? For my baked good, I have uh, a very iconic Bavarian uh, thing, which you might recognize Ooh. by the shape of it. Yes, we call it a bread. We call that a pretzel. That's okay. right. Yeah, indeed. And we call it a bread. Right. And uh, okay. we're sort of very particular about it. Every, every, kids in Bavaria kind of grows up with it, you know, it's great when kids are teething, for example, you know, because they're mm -hmm. sort of a little bit crispy on the outside, if they're good ones, and they're very soft and chewy on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so that's the perfect sort of uh, consistency, you know, to just sort mm -hmm. of yeah, slobber away, in, you know, so, yeah, so nice. that's my big food. I'm just going to be just one second. Okay. Just close the door. Right, here I am. So, and with so that, is, is that a is that sweet or savory? It's uh, it's savory, yeah. It's That's savory. right, and it's also it's quite different from the pretzels you you get to buy in packages and stuff. You know, the small ones, the little ones. So the mm -hmm. consistency is quite different to that. Yeah. And we have them, so this is sort of the standard size. And if you go to the Oktoberfest, you get the really big ones as well. Yeah. And um, which are sort of uh, about four times the size of this one, roughly. Yeah. Wow. And That's uh, impressive. Uh, what we usually do is we enjoy that a with just a bit of butter. 
just a bit it's of butter. The best combination. <laughs> Not quite yep, just a bit of butter and that's it. Yeah. Very nice. Of course, you can put in, yeah, you can put all kinds of other things on it as well, but with butter there. Yeah. 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 It's not a dunking thing, don't sort of dip it in. No, no, yeah, I've got my knife here and I'm just going to slice off a little piece of butter and just uh, put it on and then, oh, I might just demonstrate it because I have talked so much about it actually when I have a bite of it as well. <laughs> so yeah, here I've got my butter on my knife and I just go like this. And I'm off the oh, That's, yeah. <laughs> nice. Excellent. And now you won't be talking for a little while. So, so, um, so Christian, I think I, I was fortunate enough uh, a couple of years ago to be able to commission you to do a little bit of work for uh, the Woods rule book that I was, was putting out and you did a, an amazing kind of orky goblin-y type type scene for me. And then um, this year for the, the Mythic Cycles book that's just, uh, come out and I've, I've put yours in the post yesterday. So hopefully that should be with you. Yeah, nice. Wonderful. Um, yeah, that, that wonderful. Uh, what should we call them? One-eyed, bog-dwelling, club-tailed uh, monsters. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean. People know what I mean. <laughs> I know, um, exactly. So we're <laughs> so safe to get that. And again, fantastic, fantastic drawings. Really love your Thank your you. style. Thank They've got that wonderful kind of. I guess I'm going to call it folk because I don't really know what other word to use to, to describe it, but it's they're not, I think that they're not what I think of when I think of as, yeah, when I think of as kind of high fantasy illustrations, that's not the kind of vibe that, that I get. They're a lot more earthy, a bit more kind of gritty things yeah. they find in an ancient forest, which is, is why I love them. Um, and I think I first came across your work in the Relics book that Tor Gaming yeah. did. Uh, so I don't, I don't think I was aware of, and I probably saw others you'd done prior to that, but I don't think I was aware of, uh, of, of who was behind it. Um, but you've done quite a lot of yeah. illustration, have you not? <laughs> Fairly widespread. Yeah. yeah. What, what have yeah, been yeah. your favourite things you've worked on? Well, uh, now that you mentioned relics, right, that mm. was actually indeed one of my favorite gigs because um, for one, Gavin Moorcroft, who used to uh, uh, write the rules and do everything for the game, basically. He's such mm. a great guy and really good to work with. And he's so full of wacky ideas that I could just go really nuts with my concept sketches and... Um, it was a funny thing because I came across um, the Britannian soldiers by accident, you know, the puppet soldiers, right? Mm -hmm. And I just so fell in love with this idea of such puppet soldiers, right, that are animated by mm -hmm. some sort of magic, that I just approached Gavin and asked him if he had any work for me. And he said, oh, that's great. Our, uh, you know, concert artist just went off to greener pastures and uh, yes, I definitely need a concert artist. And that's how all this Excellent. happened. And we just went hard out and uh, I really had a lot of fun with this project. Yeah. But mm. that's it. I think I can tell that I you had a lot of fun with that project. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, the things we came up with. <laughs> Not everything made it into the public, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. But really it's uh i enjoy pretty much all the work i do for very different reasons see i'm sort mm -hmm. of in my interests and in my likes and all that i'm i'm a bit all over the place you know there's so many things that inspire me and that i like and i go through different phases of being into one thing or another thing you know and sort of now that it's all wintry again and the nights are getting longer and it's cold outside and all that, I'm much more into that mystic, uh, fairy tale, fantasy type of thing again, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, But in a few months' time, you know, I'll be drawing modded cars for Mad Max type settings and stuff like that. And I'll be fully into that, you know what I mean? And it's sort of... Yeah always dependent on my surroundings and my personal how I feel and all that kind of thing you know so 
Yeah, and I generally just love drawing and creating, so that's really my main motivation for all of it. And the inspirations are manifold, so I'm all over the place, as you said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> been seeing a lot of um, blood bowl work that you've been doing uh, yes, recently. Right. Was inspired by the new edition. Yep, that uh, blood bowl is another one of those topics. It's probably the only game I've consistently consistently played for well over twenty years, and I just yeah. love the game so much. And I've always done a lot of artwork, blood bowl related artwork for either my local leagues that I play in or just for my own fun and, you know, illustrating match reports and all sorts of things. Mm. And then I got approached by the people who organized the World Cup in Dornbirn uh, in 2019. And uh, I did all the concert art for the team and I did a lot of the design work for, you know, the logo and the posters and t-shirts, things like that. And because of that, Andy Hall from Games Workshop approached me um, after seeing some of those uh, illustrations and asked me if I wanted to do the comic for Spike magazine. And uh, of course, it was like, hey, you know. <laughs> and uh, naturally, yeah. I couldn't say no to that. And uh, so now I'm doing the comic for Spike magazine. Yeah. And uh, Wonderful. So from the feedback yeah. I'm getting, it's sort of people seem to be enjoying it somewhat. So I'm very, very pleased with it. Yeah. yeah it's great. It's crazy fun. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yeah. And they always come up with fun stories. And I just love all the figures. And they're so much fun to draw. And even though yeah. drawing comics was one of my first ambitions, but now I'm finding that I I have mostly been working as an illustrator rather than a comic artist. So doing sequential art is quite a different ball game to that. And so I've had a very steep learning curve in the last uh, couple of years, you know, just getting myself into that subject matter as well. But um, yeah, I, I think I'm getting there. Hmm. Well, I'm certainly very impressed by the results. It's they're looking wonderful. Really Thank nice you. piece. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I think so what I, I really is, wanted to I think the fun is that you know <laughs> having fun while you're doing the work is really important for that. Yeah. Yeah. D certainly for the kind of creative industries. I think if you're not enjoying it, you're not going to be giving your all to it, are you? So it's that's you don't get that true. freedom yeah. of expression that you get when you're really into something and you can kind of see it unfolding in front yeah. of you. Yeah. yeah. So what I really wanted to, to talk to you about, because it's it's nearly Christmas or whatever word you want to give this this kind of midwinter festival celebration that, that we're going to call Christmas because it's easier. Um, and so for the last few Christmases, these have been... Uh, dropping from I've got I managed to find two of them I couldn't find the other one but I've I've managed to find these two um these two um, Advent yeah. goblins from you this year absolutely absolutely yeah. wonderful and um I'm just gonna like show the back screen there yeah I'll link I'll link to Christian's website in the in the little box underneath because you need to go and check out his his work if you haven't experienced it it's it's wonderful so, um, and so these these kind of Christmas characters are something that you see have a lot of fun uh, playing with yeah. and, and creating. Um, and would it be fair to say that a lot of your Christmas characters are uh, sort of inspired by, I guess, earlier or kind of pagan deities of of the Wind Festival or different kind of creatures oh, of that sort of. I mean, um, the thing is, you can easily turn pretty much any figure into a Christmas character by equipping them with uh, certain um, accessories or aspects or, you know, decorations that are sort of uh, Christmassy, you know. <laughs> and uh, But a lot of these do indeed have uh, very old origins, right? And um, on that card that you said you couldn't find, which we might show later on if the email comes through, <laughs> is um, yeah. that is definitely is something that is inspired by older sort of traditions uh, from this region, actually, right? 
-hmm. because um, uh, around Christmas or midwinter, let's say midwinter, is sort of uh, a magical time for us now. But it was a pretty scary time for people in like olden days, right? It was yeah. cold and snowing and, and dark, especially. You haven't got any right? source of food and limited firewood and light, and you're not going to get any more until the spring comes. So and that's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so all kinds of traditions and myths and beliefs and stuff like that developed around these circumstances, right? And um, some of them are still being celebrated, uh, maybe even in a slightly different form than they were originally, but some of these have indeed survived and are still being uh, practiced uh, in various regions uh, around my hometown, sort of the Alpine region very much as well, Austria, Switzerland. And, and they all have sort of, a different interpretation of it, but it all harks back to very similar concepts, really, right? And um, especially those figures that are illustrated on that one card, they're sort of, on one hand, they're representations of uh, the forces of nature, for example, right? And, but also things like death and, um, uh, but also things that are meant to bring good fortune and sort of ward off evil, right? And all this has sort of been intermingled over time and all that, and it's sort of uh, somewhat different traditions have arisen from it, but the origin is still sort of clearly visible in the masks, for example, that these people wear and uh, the characters they represent, yeah. So it's a really, really interesting topic, and I have, I'm uh, sort of researching it sort of on and off for the last five years or so, but I only just scratched the surface still because it goes so deep, and there are so many different regional variations of these uh, yeah. happenings that yeah, it's uh, very interesting. I guess mm. when every um, when every kind of fairly isolated community has has an idea sent to it they don't all interpret them in the same way and they'll go off in their own sort of different variations and then you've got years and generations piled on top of that takes them off in quite a different tangential route and they'll be playing with different um different cultures in the first place as well so if an idea arrives in a community that's been used to viewing something in one way they're going to interpret that and translate it in a way that's quite different to somebody who's got a different set of experiences or a different set of underlying convictions they'll pick up on different aspects of it and of an idea that's right yeah yeah and uh, for example i've seen uh, a lot of uh, costumes uh, for those kind of creatures that i like to draw as well um from countries like hungary or romania and um you know mm -hmm. sort of slavic sort of countries and um they're sort of quite different but you can still see that it's the same underlying principles behind it all. Yeah. You know? So it, yeah. it always yeah. comes from uh, the deepest fears that mankind has always had, you know, and they're, yeah. they're sort of manifested so in different ways. One yeah. of the things I was going to ask is, do you think that that's because all communities at that time, or certainly in, under those kind of, I guess, partly forested or certainly remote con conditions, is it because their experience would have been the same regardless of what country we would now say they're in? Or is it, do you think, Never. to do with migration and groups of people going from one place to another and taking the ideas with them? Well, it's probably uh, pretty much a mix of both, but I'm, yeah. I'm well, pretty I'm convinced sorry. that, you know, if you go back far enough, that the, the lives of people in certain uh, clim climatic regions, you know, would have been pretty much the same in terms of yeah. what hardships they had to endure and what resources they had available and all that kind of thing, right? And then, of course, you have uh, the migration factor as well, which brings new ideas and new concepts to other places and all that. And so, yeah, I guess it's pretty much a, a bit of a mix of both, yeah. 
sure. Mm. Yeah. There's quite a lot of these um, characters, as well as the kind of ideas of uh, of death and darkness and um, contrast that with kind of ideas of, of light and protection and waiting for, for something else to happen to bring light back. There's, there are a few, um, I guess, kind of themes that underlie a lot of these characters, things like sort of turning structures upside down. So having um, people who don't have any power suddenly become king or lord or, or, or you know, take a, a high position in society, but usually for very brief period of time there's a kind of inversion of society um and so a sense of kind of punishment and reward which i guess being in a kind of post-christian environment you tend to think that that kind of punishment reward dynamic comes from a kind of medieval christianity that says if you're good you're going to heaven if you're bad you're going to hell and this is the basis on which we're going to sort of mm. run and direct your lives but if those if those concepts are are in more ancient beliefs then I, maybe there's something else that's going on there as well the idea of maybe deserving uh either deserving sort of good things in hard times or if hard times have come on you the sense that you're you're deserving of it and this is your your atonement or your punishment that that you perhaps haven't got enough to eat or um someone's gone out into the woods and not returned or something Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, I think the Christian influence is definitely a big factor in it all, right, which is, it has sort of colored all those what may have been ancient pagan beliefs or something or not, who knows, right, but it yeah, has sure, definitely yeah. steered them in a new direction again, which with a more black and white sort of approach to good and evil and all that, right. Nevertheless, mm -hmm. I think um, that also before that, for example, there's an interesting character in uh, those um, parades. Uh, it's called, she's called the Shirhe Lutz. I have no idea how to properly translate that. So Lutz is her name, it comes from uh, yes. Saint Lucia, which was a martyr okay. in early fifth century or something like that and uh, but she's the ugly lucia if you will <laughs> right that's sort of what her name this is, is right? this is the lady who rides on a broomstick and abducts people is that is that the one um not quite but she goes into houses and she has a sickle with her right and uh, a bowl with uh, blood and eyes in it Right, so pretty gruesome all up. <laughs> and uh, she also has a big needle and a chain with her, right? And okay. so the story goes is this. Um, as she either rewards um, people that have been good and busy and, um, you know, do what they're told and all that. And she punishes those who do, who are the opposite of that, who are lazy and, mm -hmm. you know, don't do what they're told and that kind of thing, right? And so the way she does it is she slices open her belly, right? Fills them with stones and then sews them shut with the chain, right? <laughs> so <laughs> just okay, for a bit yeah. of a picture. <laughs> and yeah. uh, I, I may even have a... Oh yeah, I do have a sketch of her as well, which um, let us see this uh, screen sharing, see if I can quickly show you that. So here we go. So that's sort of uh, my vision of her, right? She doesn't have Ooh, the face in this, but yeah, you sort of get the idea. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, with her eyeballs in it then. That's right, yeah. And um, which uh, the the bow with the eyeballs that's actually the reference to the saint, the martyred saint, because of her okay. it was said that uh, they tore her eyes out, for example, right? Uh -huh. And but the concept of punishment that's really down to you know, if you live on a farmstead like a few hundred years ago or something like that, and you don't do your jobs that need doing. Mm. Then you're going to pay for it yeah. dearly during the long months of winter yeah. because you won't have enough 
resources or reserves or whatever that you need to actually yeah. get through this. So it's yeah. it's far more a case of um, being industrious and hardworking or being lazy rather than good and bad. It's it's being diligent and doing the things that need doing or putting it off. And, and then your reward reaps itself essentially based on what you've, you've achieved or not during the time. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, then, of course, then came in the Christian aspect that defines good or bad in yeah. additional ways rather than to just being industrious and doing your jobs well and all that kind of thing, right? But also the the moral aspect and the whole good and evil thing and all that. And that comes on top of it. And this duality is uh, really nicely represented with... Um, on 6th of December, we have Nikolaus Park in Germany, which is St. Nicholas Day, right? And uh, which is basically, he's sort of uh, the picture that Santa is molded on, right? So he was a bishop yeah. and he helped the poor people and all that. And um, he comes around, he actually does come around for, or at least in my, when I was a kid, he did come around and I was so scared, he wouldn't believe it. <laughs> because he doesn't come alone, right? He's the one who rewards all the good kids and brings them, like back then it was nuts and mandarins and things like that, right? And so many stuff to eat, little presents and stuff like that. But he also has a companion which we here in Bavaria call Knecht Ruprecht. In other parts, they call him the Krampus, right? Mm -hmm. And the Krampus, most people are familiar with by now. It's become quite a, quite a sort of a pop culture figure almost, if you will, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah. he... There's a couple of horror films my, and so forth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he, back in uh, my youth, he was the constant companion of Nicholas. So you really mm. had to be good, or the Krampus would take you, put you in a stack, and carry you away. Right? And <laughs> that was a scary Did, did you experience this happening? <laughs> Sorry? Did, did the Krampus that visited you in your childhood ever put anyone in a sack and take them away? Well, my, my experience, my parents uh, actually sent the Nicholas uh, round to my grandmother's house once while I was there. And um, <laughs> yeah, it's a funny story because my grandmother, she had this front door and it was sort of glass, but you couldn't really see through it, right? It was sort of uh, semi-transparent because it was, it had sort of structure on it, you know? So you could only see shapes, right? And um, I was just really scared of the idea of the Krampus. So the Nicholas came and he knocked on the door and all I did was hide under the kitchen table until he was gone again, right? Because I was so scared of it. And um, yeah, so that was the only time my parents went through the effort to send the Nicholas around for me. <laughs> yeah. And so while I was, uh, well, I wouldn't say traumatized, but it left an impression with me. And well, it may also be why I have such a fascination with creatures like that, you know, and those concepts. Sure. Yeah. 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 <laughs> There's, um, just thinking about the, um, uh, the lady with her, her eyeballs in a, in a bowl. Is, there's another, um, there are Bavarian, um, uh, character who also slits open the bellies of of bad children. Uh, yeah, you mean is there yeah, or? Possibly. Yeah, is there? I, I thought I, I had I have this vague memory that there's a there's like a, a, a an Austrian or a Bavarian kind of witch character who who slits open the bellies of of bad. Yeah, children. that's her. She's she's uh, from around my region. Oh, same, yeah, yeah. same person, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's the thing because. Uh, a lot of these characters, even though they may be called something entirely different in different regions, they're still very similar in terms of the aspects and the concepts they represent, sure. right? And so, mm -hmm. like the slitting open of bellies, and that's a very common sort of theme, you know? As uh, sort of witches in general, all kinds of witches, there's 
which is for weather, which is for herbs and spices and stuff like that. And um, but um, uh, the Shia Hilut, the one we just talked about, right? There's sort of other representations of her as well, and um, they're sort of all sort of mixed in with each other. And uh, depending on where exactly you are, it may be that character which has more of uh, that and those traits, and in another region, it may be essentially the same character, but different traits are more pronounced, and she's called something different, so she appears at first like a different character. But yeah. it's sort of the same after all. Yeah. 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 Like for example, they they have uh, uh, the Krampus, they have so many versions of him in so many different parts. And um, I talked to a guy in Austria once, and uh, they have a totally different set of characters again, right? In name and appearance and all that. But when you get down to what they represent and what they do and all that, they're the same characters again, right? That we have here. Just the sort of different interpretations of them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure. and there's also uh, characters uh, that represent uh, concepts from Nordic mythology and Norse gods and all this, right? Like uh, one event that we have. Is sort of something you had to be very uh, wary of in, in like hundreds of years ago and stuff is the wild hunt. You may have heard of it. Mm -hmm. It's sort of a Norse yeah. story, really, right? The, the wild hunt. And it's like Odin and his uh, whole uh, uh, army and stuff like that. They ride through the night. And if you come across them, you have to like lie flat on the ground and not look up because if you do, they will just take you with them, right? And um, but if you lie flat and don't listen and don't look and stuff, then they just leave you alone, right? And we have this uh, concept still today as a story here local to my region, right? And um, yeah, so there's a lot of a lot of influences that play into it all. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Are there any, um, I guess, kind of customs that that are very particular to your to your locality, like things that you you wouldn't consider it uh, this time of year if you didn't do X, Y, Z? Like my sister uh, lived for a number of years down in Barcelona, um, mm -hmm. and in Catalonia, they have this. Uh, this very odd tradition to my mind where they uh, they take a, a log in from the forest into the house and they cover it with a blanket and they essentially treat it like a pet so they'll feed this log and they'll and then the parents will send the children out of the house on um, on Christmas morning and they will put under the the cloak of this log they'll put some sweets and then the children will come back in with sticks they'll beat this log and they'll say log shit out sweets shit out sweets and they'll hit yeah. until all <laughs> these sweets come out of the bottom and it's just it's a very odd concept that you should you should take this thing in and you should nurture it and then you should beat it to death and get good things out of it but it's obviously it's the thing that they they, they wouldn't consider it to be kind of christmas if they hadn't if they didn't do yeah, this yeah. strange tradition those whether whether you've got anything similar to that <laughs> well yeah there, there's a few things like that yeah yeah. And um, like light is always very important, right? Because up here further north in Barcelona, it's sort of quite dark for quite a long time. Yeah. And not as dark as in Scandinavia, but still, you know. And uh, so I guess light is a big aspect of it all, which is why we have uh, uh, the Advent Sunday, right? And it's the four Sundays before Christmas, and every Sunday, we light an additional candle, right? That's, that's why right. He's got so a big that's candle that's on number his head one. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. right. And um, uh, so there's those things, and, um, and then of course we also have, uh, depending on where you are, more in sort of rural areas, we have the Perchtenleute, indeed, which is the parades of those characters, right? They actually go okay. around from house to house. 
and uh, visit all the neighbors and stuff, you know, and uh, bring, and the people have to give something to them, right? Mm. It's only little things, little gifts or yeah. alcohol. Because we'd, or we'd know this is a kind of mumming thing, wouldn't we? Uh, the, That's sort of right. Mummers yeah, plays yeah. and mumming from doors. Or like the, um, um, where, let me, let me find it, because we did it in a book a little while ago. The, the, this this character, the the Mary Lou Louis, so is is a, a Welsh wassailing character who goes from door to door and demands drink from the the people in the house. I guess that's that that's a similar similar kind of idea, exactly. isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and uh, and that's exactly uh, what they do here as well. And if they're being treated well, then they do a dance. For good luck and good harvest and good health for all in the house and they sort of bless the house that they visit as well yeah yeah and then of yeah. course there is uh, uh burning incense lots of burning incense okay. that used to be really important and we my wife and i we still do it as well and it's around that time of the year you just burn a lot of incense go into all the corner of the house and basically waft out the evil spirits if you will you know that kind of thing yeah yeah yes and there used to be many smell. more traditions yeah. like that especially in uh, sort of rural areas on farm states and stuff like that because people wouldn't have much to do during winter as well right so they would sit around and tell sure. tales yeah. and you know just sort of repair stuff around the house and their clothing and whatnot you know and so it was very much a yeah. lot of sitting together and doing stuff together and yeah. 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 Not quite like that anymore, you know, it's all about buying lots no, of not presents quite. these days. <laughs> it's, yeah. yeah, it's easy to kind of romanticize it, isn't it? So that must be really nice to just sort of spend the winter sat around a fire telling stories, but, but it does go hand in hand with that kind of, we're not sure whether we're going to make it through the year kind of aspect. Yeah, that's very and, true. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No food between September and February. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's yeah. easy easy to romanticise the folk customs. Um, on sort of moving slightly onto the kind of um, miniature wargaming side of thing, have you seen um, Anna Polanc's Gun of Hecate's work? Because I just come um, across in the last week that she's got some. Um, uh kind of winter folk characters in the in the big costumes with the masks and the horns and things so they're going to be coming out next year which is, i find quite exciting her yeah, her yeah. stuff has very much that kind of old folk tale feel to like them a lot yeah yeah i have seen them i i love anna's work in general is her creativity is just absolutely amazing and uh, I also bought her, she made a, a set of playing cards. Uh, I bought myself yeah. one of those as well. And uh, uh, really, really excellent stuff she does. Yeah, and those miniatures, they look absolutely beautiful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, I would yeah. actually, yeah, I, I have plans as well for a set of miniatures based on those yeah. kinds of characters. Um, those uh, local to my region mostly. And it's sort of uh, a long project in the making, you know. We'll see how it goes. Maybe next year yeah. we'll get it out. Yeah. And um, because I think the timing for something like that is sort of, I find it quite important because I would like to sort of time it so that people can order them or do a Kickstarter or whatever well in advance of Christmas and then actually have them for Christmas, you know. That I think that would be really yeah. nice. It's difficult, isn't it, that kind of timing? Because it's it's partly, do you go with the Kickstarter runs at that time of the year so that people are thinking about it and looking at it? And then maybe you've got a year to fulfill and then to have it painted and to show it for the next year. Or do you do it in the summer where perhaps people aren't feeling quite so festive, the evenings are long, not dark and ominous, and but make sure that people have them in time for Christmas. Then you get some painted up for that year. It's a it's a tricky time, isn't it? Yeah, I guess it depends on the scope of the project a little bit as well, and how quickly you'll be able to fulfill such a Kickstarter, right? And um, so, yeah, I'm still sort of trying to figure all that out. So we'll see how it goes. 
Cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I look forward to it. It'd be great. Can yeah. we can we see a few more of your kind of concept things? Oh, you showed me a, a yeah, splash from yeah. your Instagram feed earlier. It'd be lovely to have a look at some of those. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. So these are not particularly concepts for miniatures, but uh, they're sort of uh, sketches of uh, the kind of creatures that I'm thinking about for the miniatures. Mm -hmm. So we'll just um, start from the beginning. Right. So can you see that all right? Yeah. Cool. So this is the um, uh, a sort of the typical uh, campus, I guess. Yeah. That's uh, the most common yeah. type of these creatures that you see most of around. Even at those Chris events, you know, the birch branch parades. Yeah, they sort of um, they always have certain sort of attributes and accessories that are sort of quite common to them, like the or oh, what are they called again? We call them Weidenruten. I'm not sure how that translates into English uh, right now, but I may look it up. Maybe you can add it into a comment or something <laughs> like that later on. Sure. And. Um, <laughs> Bells are always quite important. They're always quite noisy, right? Bells and rattling chains mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And of course, lots of fur and horns. Those are really the main attributes mm -hmm. of those. Yeah. And then we have uh, sort of different variations of them, you know, inspired by all kinds of... Uh, it's sort of changing as well a bit as well. There's a lot of modern figures like that now, so the modern costumes. And some of them actually look more like Lord of the Rings orcs than mm -hmm. what I imagine a traditional campus to look like. And so because it's become quite trendy around our parts as well to make these costumes and do those parades and stuff like that. Yeah, so it's certainly kind of a living tradition in that way, if you will, because it's sort of evolving and, you know, exploring new things as well. Yeah, I guess it's like a lot of the um, things that the Torians revived in the 19th century. They put a very um, kind of a vibe from their era onto it. And I guess doing the same thing now, but we've got slightly different cultural influences that we're bringing into old ideas. So there we have um, uh, what we call a Moors Weibel, which is uh, sort of a witch, I guess, you know. There's, uh, we used to have a lot of Moors and things like that around, you know. And so they would uh, represent uh, those kinds of uh, landscapes as well, you know, and the dangers that are inherent to them. And uh, Yes, yeah, so a lot of, uh, like I said earlier, a lot of forces of nature, various animals are represented as well, as you can see here. So you have uh, the, the Hahn and Gickel, which is sort of a Hahn is a cock and a Gickel is a cock as well, right? So it's sort of a, a double name, which means the same thing, but it just sort of makes it sound odd and sort of weird, you know? It's so, an uber cockerel. <laughs> that's right, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And uh, even things like the traditional werewolf, we have those as well. And uh, there used to be quite a lot of wolves in our parts, not for a long time now, but back in the day. And so that's certainly something that people always used to be afraid of as well. And they are again now since they've come back. <laughs> yeah. And uh, here we have St. Nicholas, for example. So, uh, a lot of the time, you know, people sort of think Santa may be St. Nicholas or something like that, which is sort of, he's inspired by him, but St. Nicholas was a bishop, you know, and so in our parts, whenever you see a St. Nicholas uh, coming around somewhere, he does actually look like a bishop and not a big red lobster man with a white beard and all that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, here we have uh, the giant named Upfalter. 
which sort of a character which sort of has its own story, which is sort of a tragic love story and all that kind of stuff. And he's actually a heartbroken, sad, big dude. And uh, <laughs> and I'm not quite sure what he's a sad he giant. why. He, sorry. He's a sad giant. <laughs> yeah, he's a sad giant. Yeah, because he's unhappily in love with this woman that he carries on his shoulders, and he's sort of. You know, um, I'm not exactly sure how the story goes anymore, but he carried her across the river or something like that. And since then, he goes back to the river every day in the hope that she will show up again and, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> yeah. It's a cute story. <laughs> and, uh, but I just love his name, you know, uh, the giant Opfalter. I have no idea what the name actually means, but it sounds sort of interesting. Yeah. And but that's a very regional figure, in fact, which is uh, from uh, this place called Untersberg. That's where the story comes from, and so that's where it, you may see him in one of those Pärten parades, but probably nowhere else really, right? So very specific character. So here we have Lucia again, well, the ugly Lucia. And um, then you have all kinds of masks that are just sort of fairly generic. So again, they may represent certain aspects of nature or even specific trees or something like that. So yeah, which probably harks back to a really, really pre-Christian times where trees used to have great importance for people and that kind of thing. Yeah. And here we have lots of bells. Lot of bells again. There. <laughs> yeah. yep, that's right, because <clears throat> noise is uh, very important for those events. Yeah, that's right, because it also serves, if you make a lot of noise, it serves to, you know, ward off uh, evil creatures and uh, evil spirits and stuff like that, or so people believe light and noise. Is well, and also real creatures, very probably, like. Uh a lone mangy hungry wolf isn't going to go anywhere near a bunch of people who are banging and crashing and shouting around are they they're going to that's right find yeah. someone who's alone and quiet exactly yes in the bavarian forest is uh, not far from where i live they have a very interesting tradition they call themselves the voivara which is sort of uh wolf if you will if you mean and um uh, they have all they have is these giant bells right and they're really bells about this size right and they have them they carry them around their bellies with a big with a rope or a big belt or something like that and then they make a lot of noise and they make that noise in concert right they're always in sync with each other always to a certain right. rhythm and they go faster and slower okay. and stuff like that it's an immensely loud spectacle, right? And um, but it it must have something to do with warding off wolves or you know hunting or and uh, but that's probably something that goes back to hunting wolves or warding off wolves or something like that, right? Sure, with with the name, yeah. All right, that's an interesting one as well. Oh yeah, right. He is, uh, he's called the Bloody Thomas, for right. example. It's sort of based on a martyr again, right? And so basically, his day is the same as the name day of this martyr, the St. Thomas, right? Who was uh, obviously speared to death. And, um, uh, but he also represents something else. And he's sort of like a butcher that figure the bloody thomas right because before christmas farmers used to um slaughter a pig before christmas right yeah and that pig would basically get them through the next month or two yeah because you exalt it and dry pig. it and do all kinds of things with it yeah that's right and uh that usually happens on that day so 21st of december that is right 
And um, yeah, because with the dates, Doesn't that's slaughter another thing. Big with a hammer, though, surely. Well, they used to. Really, just just knock it out straight away. In certain parts, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's definitely one method they used to employ. Yeah. Yeah, not very subtle, I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I yeah. guess it's no different from stunning now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what his uh, eaten away leg exactly represents, <laughs> but that's one of the things he's always described as having is like one bang leg, right? That's sort of kaput in some way. Yeah. And um, usually in the costumes, they have also like red bands on them and stuff like that to represent blood. Yes, yeah, so mm. a lot of subtleties for a not very subtle character. <laughs> <laughs> but a very important character and not necessarily a, um, something to be afraid of, but, but something that's very necessary for the, for the time of year. That's right, exactly, yeah. And he's also on quite an important date because that is actually the midwinter solstice, uh, the 21st, I think. And, um, and But that's all with, with the dates, that's all sort of a bit of a vague science as well because the calendars have been changed so many times over the centuries sure. and all that. And so some of those dates, they have sort of shifted as well over time. So... Yeah, and uh, but it's all very deeply symbolic and uh, all that. Yeah, and so this is actually um, this is a card uh, I recognize. Part of the card. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you have the devil who walks behind it all, right? Because uh, there is this yeah. uh, uh, spooky story about a, a pattern parade like that, right? And uh, it basically goes that uh, it used to be that only boys were allowed to put on the costumes and, uh, you know, do the parades and all that kind of stuff. But that's sort of changing now as well. But in any case, the story goes that you have to have a certain number of people to do a parade like that. Because right. there was once a time when they had not enough and they were one man short right so they went out on a parade and there was like i think there was six of them or something like that but i'm not exactly sure of the number but as they were running their parade they had an additional man all of a sudden and nobody knew who he was and it is said that that additional man is the devil right and so that's why on my car the devil is sort of chasing this whole parade here. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then in front is of the that... devil, you have death. Sorry. Uh -huh. That was the, the 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 tall character with the kind of hobby horse head. Is that a a kind of you know, snapping chomp 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 kind of head? And that's what we call uh, the harbor horse, right? Which is sort of the hobby horse, yeah. Um, well, not quite. A harbor is sort of a male goat, and the gorse okay. is a goat, right? And uh, the, the goat is goat's a female right. goat. So it represents both male and female aspects of that animal, which makes it sort of a demonic entity, if you will, right? Okay. And um, but yeah, he goes around and makes lots of noise with his mm -hmm. uh, teeth and stuff like that, and uh, just loves yeah. to scare little children. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And um, uh, yeah, it is said that uh, it's, that figure is very popular in the mountains in the Alpine region, right? Because obviously that's where you have lots of goats lots as of well, so <laughs> it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And uh, apparently they make this really awful noise. And if you hear it, you know, then you have to basically uh, get away as soon as possible. Or it's some sort of ill omen, you know, and somebody's going to die. And uh, lots of stories around it as well. Yeah. Indeed. And here again, we have the uh, giant upfalter again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, he's there. And Moose Bible is there as well. So. 
Yeah, and there we have the the, the Uber cockerel again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, in front you have sort of a light figure, you know, to sort of that it's not all bad and all dark and all scary. There's also light figures in there. And um and there's also an interesting variation of this figure which basically represents an old Roman god called Janus, the two-faced one, right? And, um, and so one variation of this figure is that it has a beautiful face in the front with like light rays coming off its head and all that kind of stuff. And then a really horrid face on the back with like surrounded by black feathers and fur and horns and stuff like that. And um, yeah, so even the good figures, they often have their yeah, dark side. other sides to them as well. Yeah. 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 So I'm, oh, yeah, I'm um, definitely coming out to, um, to you next year to, to have a look at these parades. They sound fantastic. And so they are so incredibly awesome to watch. And uh, unfortunately, none of them are happening this year, thanks to the bloody virus yeah. and all that. And, um, but yeah, hopefully next year they'll be happening again. And there's uh, be even there's bigger quite next year. For it right now as well. Sorry? They'll be even bigger next year if people haven't been able oh, to see them this year. Yeah, yeah, I would expect so as well. Yeah. And there's also not found in where I live, um, well, you know, about half an hour, three quarters of an hour's drive. There is actually a museum that they're building for all those kinds of things. I'm not sure if it's oh. finished yet, but um, it's, a, it's a club that uh, does this, those sorts of parades and also lots of research and education about it and all that. And they've uh, existed for quite some time. And they're really, really uh, big into all this, but also explaining the background and where it comes from and, you know, just sort of educating people about it. So that's very, very interesting. Yeah. And uh, this one here is also an interesting figure. It's called a Chester. And they basically, they wear these uh, sort of elaborate costumes uh, with those really big hats. And they have bands hanging off from these hats, you know, they go right down to the ground and big feathers on top and they do a special sort of dance and uh, which is quite out of it when you see it, especially when all that stuff is then floating around in front of them, you know, and uh, yeah, that's another one of those uh, good luck traditions, you know, and for good fortune and good harvest and all that kind of stuff, yeah. If they come to your house, then all is going to be well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So there you have that two faced uh, figure, which uh, is sort of uh, also called Perchter, which is where the Perchten get their names from, basically. And she is, uh, she represents all kinds of figures, depending on where you are and how people see it and all that from ancient Norse gods to Roman gods and um, also a character we call Frau Holle. I'm not sure if you're familiar with her. She's from a fairy tale and it's sort of the woman that makes it snow in winter basically. Yeah. By shaking out her, shaking out her uh, blankets and stuff like that and that's what causes the snow to fall on her. Yeah. So yeah, lots of uh, mixing of things. And this one's, uh, there's also, they're not all horrid, those characters, right? And uh, so this one's example of a uh, of, uh, beautiful pierced, if you will. And so they have these really big head masks, which usually have like coats of arms on top of them and stuff like that. and um, yeah, they sort of wander around with them as well. Yeah, so these uh, ladies here, also a little bit 40 k are another character, um, which uh, is sort of like a fog woman, right? 
It was one of the okay. days, that, especially when we had lots of moors and stuff like that, just to get lost in the fog during autumn and winter and stuff like that. And so they obviously are represented in all that as well as one of the forces of nature. Yeah. And um, so that's St. Lucia as a 40k martyr, if you will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's so much sort of um, uh, so much raw material here, isn't there? <laughs> Play with all kinds of things mashed up together to to cause things. And that's right. It's a really and, and that's why I said earlier, I've really only just scratched the surface because there's no mm. there, there's no one sort of check of characters or anything like that, because it's really and sometimes it's 50 kilometers in one direction and they have different characters with different interpretations of that. Mm. And, um, but, uh, but my, my favorite kind of masks are the ones that are really sort of over the top, you know, that have really big bulgy eyes and crooked teeth and all that kind of stuff, you know, so that they almost look a little bit ridiculous, almost more than scary. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you, for Christian, for walking us through your, your encyclopedic knowledge of, uh, of folklore. And may your, uh, your journey and your investigations take you to ever more weird and wonderful places. And, uh, and I look forward to seeing what crazy things you do with them, because whatever it is, it's going yeah, to be, be a lot. I think there will be plenty of weird places, places to be explored. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah, and, and I would love to go. I'm over for one of those events sometime. Yeah, there's, uh, because it's really great. Yeah. yeah, that'd be a lot of fun. Excellent. Well, cool. so thank you uh, to everyone out there for for watching, not just this video, which uh, I hope you've enjoyed, but for uh, watching everything that we've done uh, over the past year. It's been a very odd and surreal experience, but you know, it's no one that blows nobody any good and. I hope there have been some fun times and some lost and some good things um, in amongst it. So stay safe and uh, have a very happy Christmas. And I will see you in the new year. Bye.